greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is John Campia, and this is a companion video. Now, what are companion videos? Well, I'm awfully glad that you asked. You see, every day on the John Campia Show, from Monday through Friday, we take the second half of the show to take your live questions. However, we don't always have time to get around to all the live questions that get sent in, but I want to make sure those questions get answered properly in a video, so we gather up those unused questions and we address them here on companion videos, and that's what we're going to do right now. So let's not waste any more time and get right into it. And we're going to start things off here getting caught up with NKS432 who writes, which infinity level story should the MCU adapt in your opinion? Well, honestly, it doesn't matter. It's completely irrelevant. Um, they can take any story they want, but because you got to understand this, no matter what story they do, it's not going to be like it is in the comic books, right? We've seen that. They've done lots of stories that have elements of the comic books, but they ultimately adapt them so heavily, they end up not being very familiar to the comic books. Civil War is a great example of that. Ultron is a great example of that. I mean, on and on and on. So it doesn't really matter. All that matters is do they write a great story, regardless of which one they're taking influence from? Because if they write it great, it'll be a great movie. If they don't, no matter how good the comic book story is, it won't turn out to be very good. All right, Eduardo uh, San Miguel writes in, Despite that the use of digital cameras are being used and are now common with the film industry, a number of cinematographers still prefer to capture movies on celluloid. What are your thoughts? I mean, look, it's just about what are you comfortable as a filmmaker? What are you comfortable with shooting, right? They are a dying breed. It, to me, it reminds me of people who still want to take pictures on Polaroids. I mean, that's great. You, I mean, if hey, if that's what works for you, then you do you, man. You do you. But really, with the technology today, there is simply no reason to shoot on film anymore. There just isn't other than personal preference. And as a filmmaker, that's a big deal. Like if you're comfortable with the equipment and the mediums you're working with, that'll free up your mind to be more creative on other things. So it's fine. From a technical level, there, there hasn't been for years any reason to use film anymore. There just hasn't been any reason for years. Um, but hey, if that's what they learned on, that's what they're trained on, that's what they're comfortable with, that's what they enjoy, then as a filmmaker, you use the tools that work for you and that frees up your mind to think about other things. So it's perfectly fine, but they will be gone. I mean, another number of years, there won't be anybody left using um, uh, film uh, when the current, you know, there are certain filmmakers today that just 100% want to use film. But there's not any new filmmakers kind of, you know, insisting on just using film, not by any real m number or measure. So uh, it is what it is. But hey, you do you, filmmakers. You do you. That's the important thing. All right. Chris 34M writes, do you like my top five MCU films? Number five, Iron Man. Number four, Civil War. Number three, Infinity War. Number two, Marvel's The Avengers. And number one, Winter Soldier. Oh, I like your list very much. I mean, that's not my order. That's not necessarily, not all of those would necessarily be my, my personal top five. But those are all very enjoyable movies. So yes, yes, Chris, I enjoy your list very much. Thanks for sharing it. All right, Murray Reich writes, Marty wants to spend $200 million on one movie, but Jason Blum can somehow find his cookie jar and craft a very good visualizing film like Invisible Man for $7 million and make a nice profit. I just don't get it. Dude, this is something we talked about earlier on the John Campy show today about Marty Scorsese. Uh, you know, he, he has this new movie he's trying to do with Leo DiCaprio. It's not a big sci-fi epic. It's not a huge war film. And it was $175 million that he wanted. Now... They're saying the budget's ballooned to over 200 million. There's just no need for it. And you're right. In a world where Jason Blum is making movies for pocket change and making great, fun, enjoyable cinema, a master like Scorsese should be able to make a movie for 10 times the budget, like $70 million, and make unbelievable world-changing cinema. He should be able to do that. I don't understand this need for him to make $200 million movies. I just don't get it. And he's... I, yeah, I, I, you and me both, Murray. I think the Jason Blum example is a really good example. All right, Nick C. writes, Hey, John and crew. Disney, like many, are struggling financially as a result of the epidemic. If Bob Iger were to call you right now, what would your short-term and long-term recommendations be to minimize current losses and ensure a prosperous future? All right, thanks for that. Um, I mean, the reality is they seem to be doing everything they can do. You know, they've, they've furloughed almost a ton of their employees, their executives have taken massive pay cuts Their Their parks are closed and they can't put out their movies and they, you know, their cruises aren't running. There's, there's really not a lot to do for a company like Disney, except for, you know, take your heartbeat almost down to zero, make it look like you're dead. 
right? Slow your heart rate down. Don't, try to spend as little money as you have to right now. You know, guys like Bob Iger are, are giving up their paychecks. Uh, Bob Chapek is a, like to cut his salary in half or more than that. I can't remember exactly. They're furloughing a lot. That's it sucks, but it's what's got to be done right now. You just have to be in survival mode right now. And uh, it seems like from the outside looking in, it kind of seems like Disney is doing all the right things to keep them in survival mode. So uh, whether that pays off long term or not, we'll find out. All right. Thanks for the question, Nick. Next up, uh, Dark Helmet uh, sends in a hundred dollar super chat. Dark Helmet, thank you so much for the support and supporting the channel on that level, dude. That's amazing. And obviously, whenever somebody sends in a question that's fifty dollars or more, if there's actually a question in there, we like to honor that by not just answering the question here on the video, but then also making its own standalone video in a couple of weeks. And that's what we're going to do here, Dark Helmet. So again, dude, thank you so much for supporting all of us here who work on this channel. Myself, Ray, Fact Checker, Jonathan, Rob, I mean, everybody who works on this channel. Thank you for that. All right. Hey, John and Rob, what's your favorite Steve Martin movie? I like this question. Uh, ours are My Blue Heaven, which is great with Rick Moranis and Dirty Rotten Scoundrels with Michael Caine. Keep up the great work. Sincerely, the camping, the camping with Campia Club. Well, listen, thanks for writing that in, Dark Helmet. Um, I love this question because I love Steve Martin. There are so many great films that he has done, but I will tell you my two. Uh, and unfortunately, Rob's not here right now, but I will tell you my two. One is one of yours. Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. It is in my top 10 favorite comedies of all time. It is just brilliant and it does not age. That movie, I contend, stands up as much today and is as funny today as it is the first day I saw it. Um, and for those of you who may not know, I like to bring this up every time Dirty Rotten Scoundrels comes up, but Ian McDiarmid, the Emperor Palpatine himself, is actually in the movie and he's really good in it. Smaller role, but he's really good in it. And the chemistry between Steve Martin and Michael Caine it's just so good in that movie. It's so good. I love it dearly. And so there's that. My other one is not My Blue Heaven, but that's great too. Uh, we talked actually on the show earlier today, we talked about Bowfinger. I love that movie. It's not my other top one, but I love that one too. So many, but there's this little one he did that not a lot of people talk about. And they didn't talk about it when it first came out. And it's really been forgotten by most people. But I love it. It's a comedy. It stars him and Daryl Hannah. And it's a play on the classic Cyrano de Bergiac story. It is Roxanne. Roxanne, I laugh my fool head off every time I see it. I, I still find it deeply touching and charming. So charming. And Steve Martin is so good in it. And Daryl Hannah is good. And everybody who's in it is great. But it is just a fundamentally wonderful, I guess you could call it a rom-com. I guess you could call it a rom-com. It is a beautiful play on the old Cyrano de Bergiac. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. I, I prefer Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, but those are my top two. Dirty Rotten Scoundrels and Roxanne, those are my favorite ones. Thank you for sharing your favorites, Dark Helmet. And thank you for, again, supporting the channel on that level, man. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. I Like Cheese writes, hey, John and everyone. I was wondering if AMC could get financial relief from the government if they aid in coronavirus relief by offering their assets, their assets, whether it be the theaters for makeshift hospitals or even a food sitting uh, in those theaters. Well, no, not really. I mean, look, the, the thing about needing medical facilities for care, it can't just be anything with four walls and a roof. And an, a movie theater is not an ideal place for that. It's just not like the, really the only usable space would, I guess, be a foyer, I suppose. But you could use any building for that. Um, listen, it might come to the point where the government needs to step in for that. Now, I am not generally, if you guys watch me for a long time, I'm not somebody who espouses the idea of government handouts for corporations. I'm not. However, when you take into effect, into account the financial domino effect of what would happen to an entire industry and all their suppliers and their supply chains and so on and their providers and so on and so forth. When you look at the economic impact in an entire industry of something like an AMC theaters going under and how that will not hurt only, not only AMC and everybody that works for them, but all of the, um, like everything from janitorial services, for those places, the places that provide the popcorn to them, the, the, the soda machine makers, all that kind of stuff, but now followed on even more. 
The movie studios themselves will lose billions. And if they lose billions, other people are going to be out of work. So it creates this huge domino effect. Um, and I, that's why I believe that the government won't even have to step in. I believe the studios, if they have to, will step in and, and float AMC for a bit because they need AMC. They just can't make the money without AMC. Um, you know, they just did a, um, a fro or a Trolls 2 just released and broke all sorts of streaming records. Yay! Still made almost only half of what the first Trolls made on its opening weekend. And that's not even taking into account the cut that the digital streaming provi service providers are going to take, whether it's iTunes or Google Play or, or whatever. That doesn't even take into account the cut that they take. So it's 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 not a great situation. These places know they need, they need AMC up and running. So it'll probably come to something like that. But the notion about using the theaters, it's they're just not practically laid out for that, unfortunately. So it's a great idea Unfortunately, it's just not practical. That's all. All right. Next up, uh, Daniel Hinoja writes, uh, what new normal, what's new normal mean? Uh, will this be life now? Well, when I refer to new normal, when it comes to things like movie theaters, like I, I believe we'll get back to normal, but it'll be a little bit different. For example, let's, as an example, take 9-11, for example. Okay. Again, I'm not saying the two situations are identical. Not at all. I'm just saying there's a principle here. You know, we did get back to flying. You know, the world, a lot of people thought we will never, I'll never go on an airplane again. Everybody does now, right? The world has gotten back to flying and everything's normal. But the new normal is that it's changed a little bit, right? Like um, a TSA is a much bigger thing. There's a lot more security stuff we go through. The, 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 what we have to go through just to get on a plane, which were necessary changes, but changes nonetheless. So we got back to normal with a little bit of a difference, that's the new normal. I believe the same thing will happen, I, specifically how I don't know, but I believe the same thing will happen like the movie theater industry. Like I think we will get back to normal, but with some changes. Whether that changes, and I'm just making stuff up here off the top of my head, but whether those changes are every person has to use hand sanitizer before entering an, an AMC theater or a, a Regal theater, whether you have to you know, I don't know, for the first three years, when you come into an AMC theater, you got to wear a mask except for when you're eating their popcorn. I mean, I don't know. I'm just, again, I'm making stuff up, but I believe we will get back to normal, but it will be a new normal. And what the new part of that will be, I'm not, I'm not really sure yet, but it'll be something uh, much like TSA is to our flying experience now. So we'll see. All right. Anthony Lucalano writes, I wonder how many people are going to walk outside after everything's back to normal, looking like Robin Williams and Jumanji. Dude, I'm probably going to be one of them. I mean, like, I'll take off my hat right now, but like my, look, see how tall my hair goes right now? If you guys have followed me for any period of time, you know, I like to keep my hair much shorter and this is just unworkable for me. It's, it's completely unworkable. Like I like, I like wearing my hat, but I don't, don't usually wear my hat as much as I have lately just because I don't want to deal with my hair. I think there are a lot of people doing that. And, um, yeah, I think it's, it's, we're going to be a lot of scruffing looking nerf herders, uh, when, when we finally all walk outside again, Anthony. All right. Stubble McShave writes with Anne starting at Amazon. That's right. Today was Anne's first day with her new senior role over at Amazon. It's been great. Maybe you can get some inside scoops on the wheel of time series. It's not been featured enough on your show. Well, I, I mean, there's not a lot to talk about right now, really, but unfortunately, um, Amazon is a very big company and while Anne has a great job with them, she is not working in their movie or entertainment department. She's looking after other things. Um, so I won't be able to get a lot of scoops on that, but Hey, as, as time progresses, maybe we'll have more to talk about on that stubble. All right. Uh, that Norwegian guy, I love that name, writes in Timothy Chalamet was apparently in Norway shooting for Dune. Apparently Western Norway is being used for filming location for Caladan. Ooh. By the way, that picture came out earlier today, Norwegian guy. And by the way, if that's Norway, that looks gorgeous. Well, I've always known Norway is gorgeous. Um, but that new image that came out just looks beautiful. And I love the fact that the first image they put out was on, on Caladan and not on Arrakis. Because it's going to be such a great visual juxtaposition of Paul Atreides' life on one world as opposed to what it's like on another world. And I just thought that that first picture today got me so excited. We talked about the first image that came out from Dune featuring Timothy Chalamet as, of course, uh, Paul Atreides. 
looks fantastic. And I, I'm just very excited. It's just starting to feel real. You know, that tangibilization we keep talking about, it's starting to feel real. And I'm not surprised at all. I didn't know it was shooting in Norway, but I'm not surprised at all that's Norway because Norway's some damn beautiful country out there, man. All right. Tony Coran writes, the guard, the guard starring Brennan Gleason, which by the way, Anne and uh, Corey just watched uh, Paddington 2 again the other day, which of course also has Brennan Gleason. He's great. Uh, Don Cheadle, Mark Strong, and Liam Cunningham is a hidden gem in my opinion. I watch your show every day and I've never heard anyone mention it. It's such a good movie and well worth checking out. I'm not familiar with it. I mean, maybe I am, but I'm not off the top of, off the top of my head. Hold on a second. The Guard, IMDb. Let me look this up here. It says it's a 2011 film. No, I'm not familiar with this movie at all. I, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess this never hit theaters, at least not wide. Um, I don't even recognize the poster. And I love Donald Gleason, who's, of course, the father of General Hux, Donald Gleason uh, from the Star Wars movies. Uh, and of course, we all know Donald Gleason or Brennan Gleason best from um, uh, Braveheart. And then he was great in Bruges, in in Bruges with Colin Farrell. He's fan. Donald Gleason's great in everything. Let's see. Um, let's see. Where do we got? Who's uh, Christopher, Brennan Gleason, Rory Keenan, uh, Lawrence Killian, uh, Don Cheadle. On and on. Just great looking, looking cast. Let's see. An unorthodox Irish policeman. That's Donald Gle- or Brennan Gleason. Uh, with a confrontational personality is partnered with an uptight FBI agent to investigate an international drug smuggling ring. Again, I've never even heard of it, but I loved Don Cheadle and I love Brennan Gleason. So I'll check this out at some point. Thank you for putting it on our radar, Tony. Okay. Next up, uh, Kenneth Dowling writes, Hey John, happy Monday. Thank you so much, Kenneth. And a happy Monday to you as well. Hope you are feeling better. Um, and you're, and your is starting off great. Your the week, if you mean your week, my week is starting off great. Thank you. Uh, don't beat yourself up over this weekend. An A plus forever. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate. It. And I, yeah, I'm still. You can probably still hear it in my voice. It actually feels pretty good though. It, it feels pretty good. It's it is still affected a bit. So you guys probably hear it now and again. But. Um, but yeah, so again, thank you for everybody who participated in making it what it was. And, and I will do better next time. I will do better. I will plan better next time. Now that I've got a better idea about what to prepare for, I will uh, I will endeavor to do better next time. Thank you for the kind words, Kenneth. I appreciate that. Okay, next up, uh, Leech Live Reactions writes. Oh, it sends in a $50 chat. Well, thank you so much for that, Leech Live. And again, if, if this is a question, not only will we answer it now, we'll answer it in its own standalone video a little bit later as well. All right. I believe the movie industry needs to make more sports movies. Well, I love sports movies. Uh, and to be more specific, baseball movies. I remember growing up and new baseball movies were coming out left and right. Uh, Sandlot, Rookie, Rookie of the Year, etc. Some of my favorites are Major League as well. And I'm not a baseball fan. But this came up earlier uh, in the show earlier today. I am not a big baseball fan at all. Uh, like almost any sport, I'll get caught up in the drama of the playoffs, but generally speaking, I'm not a baseball fan. Still, Sandlot, The Natural, um, League of Their Own, uh, Major League, uh, um, uh, If You Build It, They Will Come. Uh, why am I forgetting? Uh, not Angels in the Outfield. There, there, there's another one. What's the... If you build a field of dreams, why was I freezing on that for a second? I'm not sure. Anyway, a lot of great baseball movies and I'm not even a big baseball fan. The problem, some great hockey movies. We were talking about hockey movies the other day. Slapshot, which is great. Mystery Alaska with Russell Crowe is fantastic. Uh, Miracle on Ice, uh, some great football movies, uh, some great basketball. I mean, there's, there's just really good sports movies. And the thing I like about sports movies is that sports is real drama. Like it's real human stories. And I love that. That said, not a lot of sports movies are super successful. Not a lot of them are. And so it's, it's tough because you know, it's difficult to get people into a movie if they're not a fan of that sport. And and so you kind of limit your stuff, your your potential audience right away. It shouldn't be that way, but it kind of is. So I don't know. I know if I was the head of a studio, Leech Live, I know if I was head of a studio, I would tell my execs, look, at, at least one of our films each year has to be a, sport, a sports-based film. 
I mean, if we were a small studio putting out two movies a year, I, I, okay, maybe I'd say every two or three years we need to have, every decade we need to have about three sports-based films. If we were a prolific studio, like we were putting out seven, eight, nine, ten movies a year, I'd be like, at least one a year has got to be a sports-based movie. That would be me. Uh, I don't know if those would be our more successful ones, but that would be me. Anyway, I love that. And thanks a lot for saying that in, man. And again, keep your eyes open. In the next couple of weeks, we'll be doing this question as its own standalone video on the channel as well. So thank you for sending that in, Leech Live. I appreciate it. All right. Next up, K Major writes, John, uh, I'm sorry, guys. I failed you. Hangs head. Filthies. John, my friend, you bow to no one. Uh, what you accomplished was beyond your... What, what you accomplished was beyond. Your story will be told uh, from the Shire to Rohan to Gondor. Uh, they'll sing songs of Campia the Brave. Oh, again, dude. Thank... Thank you to, to you and thank you to everybody for the kind words for uh, for this weekend. And uh, again, you guys did some amazing things that exceeded even my uh, expectations, which was great. Unfortunately, you guys exceeding my expectations exposed the fault and the failure in my planning uh, that caught me off guard and left me wheezing and choking like a little baby. Uh, but I, I will endeavor to do better. And you guys have been very, very kind and very, very understanding. So thank you for that, K Major. I appreciate that. All right. Mike Thompson writes, one of two. You know what movie really sucks? Batman and Robin, <laughs> written by uh, Akiva Goldsman and directed by Ch Joel Schum Schumacher. By the way, Akiva Goldsman can turn out some gold, too. But anyway, and directed by Joel Schumacher. You know what movie I really love? Uh, two of two. A Time to Kill, which, by the way was written by Akiva Goldsman and directed by Joel Schumacher. I learned to never judge somebody uh, by someone by their worst day at the office. It's true. We see this happen all the time, right? Like, I cannot remember which television show it was. But there's one, it was probably one of the hero shows. But the hero says to somebody, I try not to judge somebody by their worst moment. You know, that's profound, because that's what we do, right? We we tend to want to judge people, and I'm guilty of this. I think we're all guilty of this. We tend to want to judge people when we catch them at their worst moment. And we want to paint people in the entirety of their personhood based on that one worst moment that we saw. Maybe sometimes it's justified, sometimes it's not, but it is, it is a tendency we have. And I love that, that notion that they said, the hero said in that show, I don't want to judge people by their worst moment. But we also do that as film fans sometimes. Like, we'll see... Ah, Sam Raimi, you know, Sam Raimi's the guy who, uh, he directed Spider-Man 3. I hate that movie, so I hate Sam Raimi. Yeah, but he's made some great cinema. He's made some great cinema. And that's why I, to this day, look, I know Michael Bay has made crap. Of course I know that. But he's also made some pretty damn good stuff. He's made some good stuff that I enjoy. Maybe you don't enjoy it. That's fine. It, it's all subjective. But I, you know what? I love The Rock. And I really like Armageddon. And I love the first Transformers movie. And just, you know what? He's made some good stuff. So, I, I mean, we tend to do that, but you're right. That's a great example for that, uh, Mike, about, you know, don't just judge people by the one worst thing that, when it comes to film, by the one bad movie they made. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't like Steven Spielberg because he made The Terminal. And I don't like The Terminal. Well, yeah, but he's made all this other great stuff. It's a great example, Mike. All right, K Major writes, John. I was already impressed and proud of what you were doing, but then you made that video apologizing for not making your goal. Bro, you are now legend status to me. Uh, keep bringing the filthy. I appreciate that, K Major, very much. And again, the, the kind words are deeply appreciated. Um, I don't know. I don't have it in my vocabulary to express how much the well wishes and the kind words people have sent into me since that. Um, but they mean a lot to me more than I know how to express. So thank you so much for the cave major. I, I appreciate it, man. All right. Aaron Cor uh, Comer writes, do you think Hasbro can buy AMC? I believe you sent in this question earlier. I, I'm positive we answered this question earlier already. Anyway, uh, do you think Hasbro can buy AMC? They don't own a major studio, but Hasbro does lease their IP to Paramount, and they do know they do own Entertainment One. Yes, uh, we did answer this earlier, but I'll answer it again just quickly. Number one, there has been laws in place that prohibit uh, studios from owning movie theaters. However, in recent years, those laws have been getting more and more relaxed, let's say. The problem is, for instance, uh, Hasbro can't afford to buy AMC. They, they just can't. 
They don't, they don't have the money to own AMC. Plus, the studios know that owning movie theaters is a razor-thin margin business. They don't want to be in the movie theater owning business. I mean, it's one thing for Disney to own like the El Capitan, like a, a, a novel, like maybe that one theater, maybe four or five theater, but, but studios don't want to own a 500 location movie theater chain. They just don't want to because they know there's no profit in it. There's, there's the tiniest, tiniest amount. It's, it's practically a zero-sum business, if not worse. So they don't even want to be a part of that. They just want to make money off the studio, uh, off the theaters. They don't want to own the theaters. So problem number one, Hasbro wouldn't want to own AMC. Problem number two, ain't no way in any world that uh, Hasbro can afford to own AMC theaters. They don't have that kind of money. All right. A secular monk. I love that name, writes. Movie recommendation. The Mermaid. I didn't know what to expect from Stephen Chow's third film. Ended up having a great time. Stay safe. Have not checked it out myself. Now, of course, his other two films, Shaolin Soccer and Kung Fu Hustle, are fantastic. And I, contrary to popular belief, or at least other popular opinion, most people prefer Kung Fu Hustle. I am actually a bigger fan of Shaolin Soccer. I love them both, but Shaolin Soccer to me is a special, special movie. And if you haven't checked it out, you should. And by all means, and by the way, uh, Stephen Chow was supposed to be in that uh, Seth Rogen's Green Lantern movie. Stephen Chow was supposed to play Cato in that. How awesome. I mean, I still kind of like Green Lantern. I, t I admit, I, I actually kind of like that Green Lantern movie. But imagine how amazing that could have been if you had Stephen Chow in it. Yeah, just, just me, though. Uh, Mike Thompson writes, Kind of makes me wonder how much better Batman and Robin would have been if Warner Brothers' priorities had been telling a good story instead of just selling toys. But you got to keep this in mind, though. The studios always want to make a good movie. They want to make a good movie because they're greedy. And the better your movie is, the more money it will make. Now, look, understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying if your movie is good, that automatically means it'll make money. But if your movie is good, it will make more than it would have made if it wasn't good. You know, a terrible movie that makes $300 million, if the movie had been great, it probably would have made $340 million. Like, and $40 million is a lot. So give the studios the option. Do you want to make a bad movie or a good movie? Well, let's, let's make a good movie. Let's make a movie that people like. Let's try to make a movie people like. The problem is so many people think making a good movie is easy. Oh, making a movie is easy. Anybody can. No, 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 we can't. We can't. We can try. I try. <laughs> but it's very hard to make a good movie. And so a lot of people just think, so when a movie ends up being bad, they go, oh, they didn't even want to make it good. No, they would have because they know if they made it good, they would have made more money than they, than they would have. They try, but, you know, even Steven Spielberg has a bad day at the office, right? It happens. So they thought they were onto something. It was going to be quirky and people were going to love it and eat up this kind of Batman. And they were wrong. People didn't. Uh, it doesn't mean their focus wasn't on merchandising. Their focus probably was on merchandising, but believe that they wanted to make a good movie. Just that not everybody can always make a game good movie, which means we should really appreciate it when we get filmmakers to come along that do it on a consistent basis, whether it's a Denis Villeneuve or Christopher Nolan or, or you know, guys like that, Rick Famuyiwa, or uh, just, uh, just when people come along and can make quality stuff on a regular basis, we should appreciate that. Anyway, thanks for that, Mike. Next up, uh, Jermaine King writes, keep up the good work. Thank you, Jermaine. It's always nice when people want to send in messages just to be nice. So thank you for that, dude. Uh, Jesse writes, here's a pitch, okay? Disney Plus series of comedy shorts about the adventures of the two stormtroopers in episode eight of The Mandalorian. I'm done. What I'm more interested in is the two Star Wars characters created by Kevin Rubio, who's a viewer of the show and a friend of mine and Rob's, uh, created Tag and Bink. I'd be down for that. Make that series. They made a comic out of it. Make that a series. But yeah, those two stormtroopers are pretty good too. If they made it tomorrow, Jesse, I'd be on it with bells on, dude. I'd be all over that. I'd be totally all over that. All right. Daniel writes, Hey, John, long time viewer since the AMC days. Thank you so much, Daniel, for being along that long. Uh, have you checked out Code 8? That's the Stephen Amell thing. You know what? I still haven't. I thought I did, and it turned out it wasn't what I was watching. Long story. Definitely one of the better Netflix original movies. Not a top 10 of the year or anything, but definitely worth the time. Robbie and Stephen Amell are both great in it. Oh, I, I believe that about Stephen. I like Robbie Amell, too. I've met Robbie. Uh, I've obviously met Stephen. I like Stephen Amell very, very much as an actor. Uh, very much as an actor. I know he doesn't like me very much these days because I, I turned on Arrow like that. That show went to crap. That show turned on us. 
I didn't turn on it. It turned on us. And it wasn't Steven's fault. It was the writers. Uh, and then they had their up and down moments as the rest of the show went on. But anyway, I am still to this day uh, a big believer in Stephen Amell. I believe this dude should be a big star. I really do. I mean, he's already a star, but he should be a big star in my opinion. So I haven't checked this one out yet. Uh, I do intend on doing that at some point. So thank you for reminding me of it, Daniel. I'll put that back on my radar. All right. Darklock63 writes, uh, Brosnan's Thomas uh, Thomas Crown Affair is a remake. As a matter of fact, it is a remake. Uh, the original starred Steve McQueen and Faye Dunaway uh, own both, and I prefer the remake. That's actually a good example of another one that where I prefer the remake. There are a number of films out there that I actually think the remake is better than the original, and I agree with you, man. I, I think Thomas Crown Affair is one of them. Thomas Crown Affair, um, uh, The Fly, uh, The Departed, um, uh, Sabrina. Uh, there's a bunch. There's a bunch that I think are in there. Anyway, uh, own both and I prefer the remake. A double feature recommendation, Curse of the Golden Flower and Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. I'm not familiar with, with uh, Curse of the Golden Flower. Hold a second. Uh, Curse of the Golden Flower. <clears throat> uh, Chow Yun Fat, 2006. Yeah, I'm not familiar with this one. The first image that comes out looks a lot like Jet Li's hero, though. It <laughs> looks a lot like Chet, Chet Li's hero. All right, sign me up. I'm down. And he's got some recognizable. He's chowing on fat, obviously. Lee Gong. Um, man, okay. Sign me up. I'll put this one on my radar. Dark Luck, thank you so much for the recommendation. And then, of course, Crouching Tiger was nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards, for heaven's sakes. All right, so thanks for that, Dark Luck. All right, MKS432 writes, Recommendations. Munich, awesome. Memento, fabulous. Uh, phone Booth, also quite good. Triple Frontier. That's one that disappointed a lot of people. Triple Frontier ended up disappointing a lot of people because you look at the cast, Charlie Hunnam, Ben Affleck. I mean, it's, it's a solid cast. Um, Memento, there are still, even with, even with the Dark Knight being out there, there are a lot of people that to Memento is, the, to them, is Christopher Nolan's best film. It's certainly the movie that put Christopher Nolan on everybody's radar was Memento. Uh, Guy Pierce, fabulous in that movie. Um, I love Memento. Of course, my favorite Christopher Nolan film is Insomnia, which nobody's watched, but hey, it is what it is. And Munich, an underrated Steven Spielberg masterpiece, which, by the way, also was rec was nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards that year. So that's some nice recommendations there, NKH. All right, or NKS. Uh, Joey writes, I don't know if you've heard, but Disney has delayed, yeah, Soul to November of uh, November 20th, uh, 2020. Any thoughts? Makes sense. I'm a little bit bummed out that they pushed it that far. I'm a little bummed out that they pushed it that far. But, hey, they could have pushed it into 2021. They could have put it into 2021. So I'm okay with it. It makes sense. You know, we were questioning that the other day, saying, like, why is that one still not moved? Like, do they know something we don't know? It makes sense, so it's probably a good move. And again, while I'm a little bummed it's that far away, at the same time, it could have been worse. It could have been into 2021. It could have been into 2022. So I'll take it, Joey. I'll take it. Just as long as they put it on the big screen, because this is a movie I don't want to see in some pathetic, stupid home television. I want to see this on the big screen in the movie theater, so I'm glad they're doing that. All right, Jay Master writes, Breaking news, Pixar Soul coming out November 20th, 2020. Yep, it's something that they had to do, and I'm actually a little bit surprised it took them this long to do it. Uh, but hey, again, as long as it's not pushed too much farther than that. Uh, Mike Schwenk writes, Trivia about perks of being a wallflower. Okay, sign me up here. Um, uh, trivia about perks of being a wallflower and Jojo Rabbit both end with the hero by heroes by David. Okay, so that came in. Somebody asked that earlier. Like, what's the what does perks of being a wallflower and Jojo Rabbit have in common? Both end with hero by David Bowie. You know what? We can be heroes. Is that how Jojo Rabbit ended? I don't remember. I love that movie. You guys know how much I like Jojo Rabbit. I can't remember that. I can't remember that. Maybe I just is already such an emotional mess. I wasn't even paying attention to this song that was playing at the end. But that's a good piece of trivia, Mike. Thanks for sending that in. All right. And the final question to come in here. And then we were all caught up on the questions that came in while the show was still on today. Uh, Fifty Shades of Geek writes, I love the Fat Thor montage idea. It's a great way to close out the, that gag. Silver Surfer made his comic debut as a blink and you'll miss it in the background character. It would be nice if the MCU version could do the same. Maybe not in Thor 3, but eventually. Uh, not important though. Like playing that kind of homage isn't important at all. But yeah, a lot of people are wanting 
you know, like the next Thor, like Thor four, I guess, uh, Love and Thunder, to start with like some kind of training montage, like a Rocky based training montage where you see Thor now getting into shape, right? And if they do it, I'm cool with it because it could be really fun. At the same time, I kind of agree. Like Taika Waititi, when he's asked about it, he basically said, I mean, I haven't decided yet, but aren't we kind of done with that? Like, I feel like the gag is done. You know, the gag was done when the portal scene began in Endgame. As far as I'm concerned, it's time to move on from the gag. But again, if they did decide to do some kind of fun montage where he's like, you know what, it's time for me to get back into as guardian shape and then you know has some kind of workout routine where he's bench pressing mountains or something like that why not? i'd be up for it why not but at the same time maybe they should just start the movie with him being in shape again i i don't know we'll see how they go from there 50 shades all right guys and that'll do it uh, for this installment of the companion video. Thank you so much for being here. And guys, special thank you to all of you who sent in the questions, not just because you gave us great fun things to talk about, but also because you supported the channel while you were doing it. And all of us here at the John Campy YouTube channel, thank you guys very much for that support. Don't forget, guys, the John Campy Show returns again tomorrow morning with me and Robert Meyer Burnett. Or we're definitely going to talk about Soul, a few other moves by Disney as well. By the way, we got a number of other things we're prepping for that show tomorrow. And don't forget, also, guys, because Become a Patreon supporter. And for those of you who are Patreon supporters already, thank you for being Patreon supporters. But go check out our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash John Campia. And just so you guys know, the podcast version of the John Campia show is up and running. And you can go and find that on your podcast app of choice. All right, guys, that will do it for me for now. Thanks a lot for being here. My name is John Campia. And until next time, my friends, bye-bye.